Welcome to Take It From The Iron Woman. My name is Susanne Müller, your host and the Iron Woman. This podcast is about empowering yourself and others to make real changes in the world. You will hear from everyday, smart, sophisticated, hip people like you and me. Not everybody has to be an Iron Woman to impress the world. Together, we will learn from the sports and business leaders how you can become a more successful person as an entrepreneur or a leader. It's one step at a time, one day at a time. Take your steps now. Take your big steps now. Join me on this journey to success. Take it from the Iron Woman. We have spoken to Robert before. He's a triathlete. He's an entrepreneur. He likes to have challenges. He does not get bored. Listen to his journey that he is taking us on. I'm wondering, what do you think you take from the triathlon? And it seems like you're, a, my assumption, a risk taker. How do you transfer that into business? I mean, luxury skin care? Can mm -hmm. you take risks? Your wife is taking over. You're, you're behind the scene. Oh, there's risks all the time. <laughs> She's the name of the brand and the formulator of it. And it's certainly a lot of her. And it's certainly a lot of me, too. And May and I are lucky in that we have aligned values and almost no no overlap in skill. <laughs> we don't butt heads on things very often because we don't try to do each other's work. But when it comes to making a hard decision, it's usually pretty easy for us to. What you have to do after you make the hard decision is usually very challenging. And that the, that's the part that's hard. The deciding part, we tend to have a very easy time with. So I just said all of that. And now I want to bring it back to triathlons. There's just something about The word clarity started coming to mind. I don't know. There's that aspect of triathlons. Like it is the time for this, mm -hmm. whether, whether you wish you were running or not, it's time to do the run, right? There's a time and place for those things. And it's not, not particularly up to you. Once you've decided that you are going to do the race, those are the three parts. Some of them might be easy and some of them might be hard. You'll enjoy some parts of it and the other parts will be a slog. And there's probably going to be a slog no matter what you've done. Mm -hmm. Then the, the game is to play the infinite game and go, well, the only way through this log is through. <laughs> there isn't an, an around. So in business, there's sometimes some arounds that we can do, or we can do a, a sort of pivot post decision to maybe change the circumstances or navigate um, mm -hmm. how you're implementing this hard decision. But the, yeah, when, I don't know, it's like this kind of thing is like triathlons are not about being fast. Actually, they're a curious thing for me because in almost, almost all of my other athleticism, I'm I'm very competitive or, or that competitive drive was a helpful thing for me. I noticed that in triathlons, that was completely gone. I had almost no competitiveness at all, except for, except maybe in the last hundred yards of the run. It's like, well, I can be, <laughs> I know I've got enough juice for a hundred yard sprint. I think there's something about that, that swim where it's like it mentally is like, well, I'm, I'm not trying to be a professional triathlete. I'm trying to like do something that's hard. And like, know that I can do it. Yeah. So I guess in that sense, inventing, generating a company out of nothing in a room mm -hmm. at my house. And now a decade later, having a bunch of employees and a global sort of footprint in the clean skincare industry. And that's been hard too, and, and very worth all of the challenge. Congratulations. It's not so easy <laughs> to break into the skincare when we see all those uh, big companies. It's important to have a, a good brand that speaks to others. I looked at your website and it's amazing. And I'm like, must smell beautiful. <laughs> yeah. If it, yeah. If it, if it looks good, I, I wish you could feel and feel and smell it. It's all a very sensorial experience. That reminds me of another iron, <laughs> triathlon thing is like, you talk about everyone should just run their own race. Mm -hmm. It's all the same course, but it's like, for me, I was predominantly competing against myself is usually what I was doing. And so I was running my own race. And and that's, I think, the thing that May and I take great pride in is almost to a fault. We don't do things because it's the way other people do them. If someone suggests something that way, this is the industry standard or something, there's legal requirements and things yeah. like that. And within, within the bounds of legal requirements, we do the legal requirements. But when there's a sense of, oh, this is how customer service is done, or this is how I don't care at all how other people do it unless you're sharing that with me because it's the best possible way to do it. And then I'm very interested. We've I been like running our own way. race. 
a long time now. The beauty of that is, and again, I've said values a lot, but if you're making hard calls that are consistent with your values and it doesn't go right, as we talked about in the you know, Alt MBA, a good decision is independent of a good outcome. Knowing that if one of the hallmarks of a good decision is that it's in alignment with your values. So if you have a good decision that's aligned with your personal what's it for and it doesn't work out outcome wise, you just learn something, right? There mm-hmm. isn't like a sense of shame or you're not going to blame. You don't get to blame somebody else's mm-hmm. idea for your decision. So that's one of the beauties of <laughs> calling your own shots. It's one of the downsides is you don't have someone else to blame. We just did what the marketing people said everybody else does, because then you can just make it be about them instead of about the fact that that was what you chose to do. Yeah. So there's some kind of extreme responsibility that can come in there. And there's some problematic <laughs> internal <laughs> communication that can happen when that doesn't go well. The, but yeah, in the long run, I don't know how else to go about making decisions that are, especially, yeah, especially as the stakes grow and it's I've got 30 families to think about and all my employees and how decisions we make ripple through their lives and our Mm -hmm. clients and all that. There's a lot of, that's a small little company by lots of measures. And then also much bigger than May and I ever imagined it really being. It's an interesting tension (laughs) to operate between those things. And how many employees do you have now? We currently have 26. It's a small company. It's not only you and your wife. So Sure. And we're kind of rare in the skincare world in that we actually make our products and do all of our own fulfillment and stuff. So that m- m- lots of skincare companies, you hire a lab to do the production and yeah, mm-hmm. our fulfillment company to do the fulfillment. And maybe to another fault, we insource everything. Oh. We we make it all, we ship it all. We answer everyone's questions about it. It could be a four-person company, but I'd, I'd much rather have a 26-person company. That Yeah, because that way we actually get to take responsibility for all the people that actually work for and with us. And that's been highlighted over the last year and a half to me as well, because there's a way that you could have operated where it's like, well, we still have all the, pro- quote unquote, all the product we could sell and we can ship it no problem because those aren't really our employees. And it's not our problem to worry about whether they stay safe or get sick or whatnot, or how they are treated at that other job that they have. That's another reason why I sort of on purpose, we try to keep everything because then we can know how much people get paid and that they mm-hmm. have health care and that all of the things that people, I don't know, that I think <laughs> are, are, I believe a lot in Maslow's hierarchy. And like, if you operate in a, in a culture where if you've created a job that doesn't satisfy the base of the pyramid, then you haven't really created a job. Just thinking on the responsibility for all those 26 people in the COVID situation Mm -hmm. is not so easy, right? It's one of the the parts of going with being the boss or being the leader. I'm both. Those are different things. One of the things that I was really grateful for is that I know everyone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so of those 26 people, easily 10 of them were already remote. Like our customer service team has always been remote and they're spread around. I guess there's some in Europe now, but Europe and Canada and the United Mm -hmm. States. But we do in-person work. (laughs) We got to look at each person who would come to the studio and it's like, well, can you be safe at home? Mm -hmm. Can you get here safely? Because once you're here, that's like, I can work on the, whether you're safe here or not. We got to do that sort of continuity check to everyone. We have some single parents. And it's like, okay, well, there's no, you can't come. There's no child care. Because you yeah. need to watch your child and like, mm-hmm. and sure, we could maybe figure out how to set that up. But for now, our definition of we is going to already includes you. And so a way that we're going to readjust that is we're all going to work so that you can stay home mm-hmm. and be paid completely and have health care. And we're going to figure out how to get you groceries and you aren't mm-hmm. penalized for not being married. Yeah. <laughs> or for having had a child. I was very grateful that I, I have a company that's small enough that I know everyone. And I have a lot of empathy for where people were more, more or less having to manage by the numbers and just, mm-hmm. you know, make a decision and then communicate it to a thousand people. There's obvious that that's not going to go well. For the 15 people I got to ne- negotiate that with, it's still uncertain. Is this really the right way to do this? And it's like, well, but this is what we're going to do. We're all going to take care of each other. We We did in-person work the entire time. It was very few people in the sort of the beginning times because we didn't have a single COVID case on our team. We had COVID cases like within families, family members of our teammates. And so we would quarantine or we would get them somewhere else to stay so that they didn't have to quarantine in a home with someone that had COVID and just hope that it didn't, you know, cruise around the door <laughs> while their wow. their sister or their mother or whoever it was navigating their 
their illnesses feel very grateful. And that, yeah, that's another thing. It's like, I was checking my thinking constantly. It's like, do I feel comfortable and good about the things that the decisions we've made because no one has gotten sick yet? Will I still think that if one person gets sick or when all of them get sick or anything in between or when someone dies? What will I think that I made good decisions then? I luckily don't know. I did not. One of those, one of those questions was not the reality. And so I, I didn't get to check my thinking or my feeling about how that would really plan out, play out in reality. I'm happy yes. that you were, I don't want to say lucky, but that luck was on your side. And I think mm -hmm. when we talk about luck, it's also about risk taking and certainly you are taking risks. And I remember, and I was impressed when you and I spoke once and you said you have like an accountability group or a mastermind group. Mm -hmm. You're still meeting with your friends. Yeah, that's another thing that I do with Reboot. And yeah, every two weeks I meet with, at this point, their jobs have changed and stuff since we originally formed the group. But I honestly don't remember how long it's been. It's probably been three or four years. But there are other originally non-CEO co-founders, which is a very specific subset of the, who are interested in mindful leadership. They even found six of those who could meet consistently <laughs> every two weeks. But yeah, that's been a, a helpful resource for Again, thinking about my own thinking and questioning yeah, it because yeah. I can be my own little echo chamber. Yeah. I hold status and sort of power over my employees and, you know, and stuff. Would, would they say no and go, mm -hmm. that's a bad idea? Like, I hope so. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Having lots of different sources of, of input and feedback and different perspectives is really helpful. And, and that, yeah. that group's a pretty consistent source of, of information for me like that. So is that your, how you recharge your batteries and get like different perspective from that group? That is probably the most, con one of my more consistent more points of self-care. <laughs> like I'm in the self-care industry, but I'm very like not good at, or I would not describe myself as good at self-care, but I'm a very social person and a very curious person that every two, that hour and a half, every two weeks, like honestly, like the, as social as I am, but with my work and my family, like my world's honestly pretty small outside of, if you're not, if you don't live in my house and work with me, like I, I probably don't see you every two weeks. The other members of this group, I see with more consistency than any other people in my life. I'm a That's little embarrassed end. by it though, too. Like I would like to have more close friendships or that sort of sort of vibrant community where that wouldn't be true, but it's true for now. The space that mm -hmm. those, those people, I guess it's all men now, but it's varied over the years that those the colleagues have held for me. Well, I think it's important to have that support in a way, and you have established that for over the years. It's when you are in the C-suite, and I know it's lonely. And as you said, your employees, your wife, your family, and that's mm -hmm. about it. And with the COVID situation, it's even getting smaller, it feels like. Yeah, that group mostly serves to as evidence that I'm not alone. <laughs> My company is a fantastic piece of evidence of that on a daily basis, which is funny because my mind still has this narrative and script of like, oh, only I can do this or only I can fix this or some false constraint like that. I will be thinking that on a call like this, if I happen to, there aren't really offices in our building, but there's, there used to be one and it had glass. And it's like, if I look out that glass, there are 20 people helping me every day yeah. without me telling them anything. I don't yeah. tell them what to do. Like they know what to do. <laughs> My work is a beautiful counter example to some of the thoughts that and some of the scripts that run in my head. Yeah. But that's about the, the mindful leadership, right? You don't, you're not telling the people what to do. It's like a well oiled team. When I listen to you, what comes to my mind is also that people want to work with you. That seems to be the case. Yeah. The one of the things that I'm really grateful for about our company is I, I don't know the actual number, but probably the average length of time that someone has worked for us is four years. Most of our employees have worked for us longer than I have ever worked, other than maybe Mail Instrument Skin's the longest I've ever had a single job. That fact is not lost on me. I, it's pretty incredible. Like the most junior person on our team just had their anniversary. And the only reason that they even had the anniversary is because they're, they're related to one of our, we, anyways, we could do our COVID thing because we had a very strong circle of trust. Mm -hmm. I know all of the people that I am talking to a lot. Is it actually safe at your house? If it's not, it's okay. 
please tell me and we will navigate that, that set of circumstances from, you know, from a reality based situation and not hope wishful thinking. And the way that we're a family business is May and I are re- related, obviously through marriage, but there, there are multiple other families within our company that have multiple members of that family that work with us. What a cool talk with Robert. Always inspiring to hear from his philosophy to hear from what he's doing and how successful he is. Take it from the Iron Woman. We have episodes every Monday, every Wednesday. Don't miss out. There's something for everybody. And if you want to have coaching with the Iron Woman, reach out. I will show you. I came from Switzerland to New York to Kilimanjaro, completing the Iron Man. A lot to share a lot to learn, a lot to grow with me and with you. Thank you so much for your support. 